there's something lovable about this incredibly ungracious cat uh, that people can relate to. Universally, I have never seen one article of Garfield that isn't cute. It's all cute. All of a sudden, you're sitting watching TV some night, and you're watching a completely different sitcom, and something about Garfield comes up. And you realize that everybody knows Garfield. And I think Jim Davis has really understood what, what people needed. Jim Davis is the perfect storm, right? And, uh, and Garfield is the result of that. I was born in 1945 on a little 120 acre farm about five miles outside of Fairmount, Indiana, east central part of the state. And, uh, and life was great. It was one of those glorious childhoods filled with sunshine and running through the fields, cats and dogs and animals and, and good times. It was uh, laid back um, as a rule. Um, this was kind of a bedroom community. It was, you were either a farmer or you worked for the automotive industries that were everywhere at the time. And uh, half the kids in your school were uh, farm boys and girls or, uh, or not. I grew up on a farm with about 25 cats on average. I guess the only, only downside uh, was that I was asthmatic. So I did spend uh, a lot of my childhood, you know, in bed uh, uh, because uh, I was allergic to just about everything. But as a result of that, my mother always put a pencil in my hand and encouraged me to draw when I couldn't go out and do chores or uh, be with the animals or anything. So that's really how I developed my skills. Uh, to be a cartoonist. Now, while asthma worked for me, I wouldn't recommend it to everybody, <laughs> but uh, drawing uh, was a way of communicating, a way that you know other artists might sing or dance or write poetry. For me, it was drawing, and uh, that uh, I learned early on to use pictures with words because my art was terrible. <laughs> I would draw a cow, you know, and I would write the word cow and draw an arrow down to it. So. I always put words uh, uh, with the picture, so I guess I came about it naturally. I, I, I was never able to separate the two. Both sides of the brain uh, were trained early on. I attended a very small high school in Fairmount. I played four years of football. I was obviously a, a, in the art department, but 4-H uh, speech club. I was in school plays uh, all four years. Um, uh, acting for uh, Adeline Knoll, who was James Dean's drama coach. I actually learned a lot about doing a comic strip from doing theater because there's not that much difference in it in that by virtue of being the cartoonist, I get to write the script, I get to set the stage, I get to determine the blocking and uh, uh, determine how everybody moves and acts with that. I just, all I do is freeze frame them and draw them, you know, in three frames. When I started at uh, Ball State Teachers College uh, in 1963, um, the uh, only thing that they offered in art was art education. So for three years, I, uh, uh, studied in the art department toward being a teacher when actually I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to do something with a craft. In the back of my mind, I'd love to be a cartoonist, but that just seemed you know, so far out there. When I finally got it to the part where I actually had to do the student teaching, <laughs> where the rubber hit the road, I decided, yeah, maybe if I go over to business, maybe I can get into advertising or you know, art studio or something like that. While that wasn't really what motivated me, it nevertheless gave me uh, some great background for eventually doing what I'm doing, you know, with this business. Uh, unknowingly, I, I thought I was going to be working just in art, but as it turns out, with licensing and uh, those kind of opportunities that were afforded, you know, the comic strip, why uh, I'm glad I got that experience as well. I paid a visit to uh, Tom Ryan, who did the Tumbleweeds comic strip and uh, he was uh, only a few blocks from the university and from where I worked at the commercial arts studio. And I showed him my art. 
and he asked me to become his assistant. And I said, well, I have to think about it for sure. <laughs> and so uh, in 1969, uh, I started working for uh, Tom, TK Ryan, as he signed his strips. And I worked for Tom for nine years, uh, doing the backgrounds, borders, balloons uh, for Tom and uh, how, doing the inking and stuff like that and uh, answering his fan mail. So I, I got sort of a feeling of what it was like to maintain a syndicated comic strip. During the course of that nine years, uh, I tried to come up with some ideas to syndicate a strip myself. That was always, uh, that gave me the confidence working for Tom to try to go after a strip. Tom had said that one syndicate executive said, you know, it'd be great to have maybe a comic strip about bugs. I go, bugs, I can do bugs. So. I uh, created a strip called Normnat, G-N-O-R-M, G-N-A-T. Like, like so many cartoonists that are, that are trying to, to find something that's going to stick, you know, you throw a lot of spaghetti against the wall, you know, to, to find out what stuff's going to stick. So he did, you know, uh, Normnat, right? And he, he was working on um, the tumbleweeds uh, for a little while, honing his skills for, for another master of the craft. Um, and I think at one point, you know, Norm Nat got rejected and uh, they just like, yeah, bugs aren't funny. Bugs, nobody can relate to bugs. And so I just had this Norm walking down the street. He's just in great mood. And I had this big shoe come out of the sky and squash him flat. <laughs> and that just ended the strip. So I took a long, hard look at the comics and trying to come up with something I wanted you know, that people could relate to. I noticed dogs were doing really well in the comics. Snoopy, Marmaduke, Fred Bassett, uh, Daisy, but no cats. And I thought, ah, if dog lovers like dog strips, maybe cat lovers would like a cat strip. I spent a lot of time with the cats and the dogs outside. You know, I, I felt like, you know, I could understand them, but they really, Garfield is based as much on people I knew as uh, on the animals I grew up with. I just put a human personality in a cat's body, but I think uh, there's some truth to that in that dogs are dogs. You know where you stand with your dog. You know what your dog's thinking. Cats, uh, they're a little withdrawn. You know, they're a, a little subdued. So people tend to, I think, lend human thoughts and feelings more to cats than they do dogs. So as a result, I can get away with Garfield thinking human thoughts. He's a human, he's a human in a cat suit, essentially. And um, that also gives me a lot more latitude with the humor. He's everybody's alter ego in some fashion. You know, if you're the uh, uh, shy, quiet type, he, you can uh, see what you would like to be in Garfield. And I think everybody can identify with him in some fashion. And even when he's kicking Odie, you know, it's like, I'd like to do that to my boss, you know, but you can't. And, uh, but Garfield can get away with it. I um, went to uh, a Holiday Inn in Indianapolis for three days and just sat in a room with piles of paper and, and pens and pencils. And I just thought about it. So I thought, okay, a cat, what would a cat, um, be like if it was human. I go, well, you know, cats are pretty much out for their own creature comfort. It's probably the same thing. We are food, shelter, love, period, uh, with no excuses. So, uh, and so I created this cat personality. Then from there, I created the, uh, the opposites because humor comes from conflict. Humor comes from tall, short, that skinny, smart, stupid cat dog. So, so if so, I created, you know, this cat with forceful personality, his, his own mind about everything. So I gave him an owner who was kind of wishy-washy, daydreamer, an optimist as opposed to the pessimist. And then I gave then I gave them a dog. So as, as calculating as Garfield was, the dog was a free spirit, kind, loving, trusting not the brightest thing in the world. And so uh, that contrasted with, with Garfield. And uh, so 
with that cast, I put them together and it was like, um, it was like lightning in a bottle. They just started, they just interacted. When I write, uh, when I create characters, I, I usually have something in mind or I hear a voice or I have, you know, someone in mind. And I will have to admit that I am John. <laughs> you know, got the big cheeks, easygoing, you know, wishy-washy. I do, I'm, I, I look forward to Mondays. I love mornings. And I, I look, harken back on my experiences, you know, from Ball State days and stuff like that. You know, John's uh, lack of success with dating and stuff, you know, it was just the, those awkward moments and stuff like that. So I drew a lot of my own experiences for John, absolutely. And uh, which makes him the perfect foil for uh, Garfield. Initially, Garfield was fat and uh, squinty eyed and, and didn't have stripes. And uh, unlike human beings, as Garfield got older, he got skinnier and cuter. Jim Davis um, has perfected exactly the form that he wants Garfield to look like. And it's really interesting, actually, if you look over the course of the 40 years, the adjustments that have been made to the various characters, to John, to Garfield himself. And this doesn't just happen accidentally. You know, I mean, Jim intentionally goes back every few years to say, do we need to adjust this so it doesn't stay boring? My strip Garfield uh, really doesn't deal with any uh, social or political comment whatsoever. That's for the rest of the paper. That's for the news broadcasts. And uh, so if I, if I say anything with a strip, it's lighten up. <laughs> uh, uh, shouldn't take ourselves or the world so seriously at times. I can consciously put Garfield into a situation, uh, up a tree, camping, looking out a window. But then my work's done, uh, then I just watch. And, uh, and he writes the material, you know, I ask myself, where would he go, what would he do, what would the other characters say and do? Then when they do something funny, I back up three frames and cut it off. I get to say and do a lot of things I ordinarily wouldn't, as me, because I'm a really positive, kind of beat guy, and I, so I, I get to, you know, vent through Garfield sometimes, you know, through that kind of writing. 30 days into the strip, I had 41 newspapers, and the biggest paper, the Chicago Sun-Times, dropped it. They thought if they dropped the newest strip, they would get the least reaction. And you have to understand, I mean, the way these decisions are made, it's an editor, and he gets called on by other syndicates that have other comic strips, and he might go home and ask his kids or his grandkids, but there was no scientific way to do this. They dropped the comic strip, and the letters to the editor were out of this world. Um, they, you've got to bring it back, and it was so loud that not only did he bring it back, but it made the newspapers all over the country. They asked me to do a, a strip yeah, coming back to the paper, you know. And I did, I did one Garfield saying, oh, it's back. good to be back in Chicago. And so major newspapers in, in the major markets began to ask, mm, maybe we should get Garfield. It gave me a good feeling um, that uh, maybe Garfield had staying power uh, already. The, uh, the fans uh, are everything. We get stories, you know, to this day uh, that just rip your heart out. You know, somebody may be going through a rough time, but the strip helped them. I had thought it would be fun to be able to do licensing. Uh, I wanted to do books. Uh, I mocked up a book, and uh, the, uh, the only thing is, it wasn't the format of all the other books. All the other books were uh, mass market books. That they, they cut the strips apart and ran them vertically. Well, you, you have to read it, you know, from left to right. You can't read it vertically. The timing's gone. So, um, so I created a horizontal book. Yeah. And finally, Ballantine Books came along and said, uh, hey, um, what would it take to get a Garfield book? A uh, couple of editors have been reading in the paper and they really liked it. And I said, how about this? And they go, well, that's unique. They said, it'll never work. They'll have to create a special place for it. And Jim said, precisely, they will have to do that. Because it, it couldn't be put on bookshelves, they had to be put uh, on end caps and by cash registers. And sure enough, Garfield, the Garfield books 
became quite a phenomenon, and that became known as the Garfield format, and is still known as the Garfield format in the publishing industry. When um, I had the opportunity to do some licensing, um, I, I was at a crossroads. Do I just be a cartoonist and let other people you know, handle product if there is any, if there is any success? And so, or do I get involved with that because I've been at a commercial arts studio, I knew art production. Early on, uh, I was living over on the edge of the university in a, a, a little house, and we had a couple of artists downstairs uh, working in the house, and it was getting busier and it was getting crazier already uh, by 1980. As I understand it, he formed Paws Incorporated in 1981 because things began to happen and they needed a structure and a framework um, to put everything behind. But even in 1981, I think they, that he may have had one or two employees, an assistant on the strip, and someone to start the marketing and sales associated with the, the comic strip. And we were, we were beginning to get requests already. I started hiring artists and hired a writer and hired a music writer and then art director and then, then we needed account executives to work with the companies who were making the products. I think the logistics of growing with the program have taken as much time as doing you know, the program. But uh, it gave us a nice control, kept all the program and the products and the services worldwide closer to the source you know, the inspiration for the character and everything, and so it served us well over time. As the number of papers that carried Garfield increased uh, little by little, they used to hold, even before I joined the staff, they used to hold 100 paper parties. But his kept going up 500, 600, 700, and, and we knew that something uh, really interesting was, was going on. I started building my studio next door to keep quiet because it was getting really noisy and violent in the art department, you know, with all the activity. Then we, we had more artists, so we expanded, added onto the house, and we built a second story on the house. And then finally, I built a big barn, moved the staff into a pole barn, spent a year and a half, and built this facility. It was nothing by design, but it was more in response to what we felt the market needed what was best for the program. Our motto is, if we take care of the cat, the cat will take care of us. There's not a profit motive or anything. It's actually, if you do something, do it right. And he's been there. It's not like he came back. He's been there the whole time, running this billion dollar a year empire from Albany, Indiana. To do a comic strip, all you have to do is be near a mailbox in 1978. So I really never had a reason to move away from Indiana, and I had uh, no desire to either. Friends, family, everything was right here. By virtue of having grown up on a farm, I really wanted to get back to the country. That's where I feel normal. You know? And so it's great to step out of the studio and walk through the woods or through a meadow and, you know, uh, have the sky, you know, as your only limitation and think great things, you know, I, I like working in this kind of environment. What I've done with the 30 acres here uh, is a reestablished prairie uh, and reforest. Uh, and occasionally we'd break a tile and form a pond and things like that and wildlife started coming back. And as a result of studying this and doing this, we got involved with conservation and so we plant more and more trees. Uh, my uh, ultimate goal is to plant a million trees. Okay, I'll do this the clever way. Want to play hide and seek, Cody? Yeah, yeah. Find a real good hiding place. I'll count to a hundred and then come after you. All of the original primetime specials, I, I wrote all of those. CBS came and wanted to do the Saturday morning shows and I said I can't write that many shows and do the comic strip. So we found a great writer uh, who uh, had been writing a lot of sitcoms, a guy named Mark Evanier. Mark and I were just joined at the hip, and so we, uh, for uh, seven years, uh, did the CBS specials. He would write them. I, I, we worked together on treatments. 
I'd get a lot of them ads, and I came out, I directed I all of the voice tracks then for seven years. <laughs> he knew what he wanted, he knew the timing that it was intended in order for it to come across the way that he wanted it to, so he would direct those sessions. Oh, we're wearing our doggy coat, aren't we? Don't we look just precious in our I get to let him go. Coat? Use kind of words and motions and everything and interacting with the other characters to get a point across. When I'm working with him in the comic strip, it's 25 words or less, you know, seven inches in the comic strip, very little space, and uh, two-dimensional, no sound effects, no music, no anything, and you've got to get that story across. So freeze framing him actually is, is harder work than letting him go and having music and sound effects and all kinds of wonderful things to work with to help set the mood and, and drive the pacing of, of a story. Ah, We've always lived in a time where the 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 society over. makes us feel guilty about overeating, oversleeping, and so we carry that guilt. Garfield not only defends his right to do that, but he's cool with that. He's cool with himself. And therefore, we, we look at that, and it's like showing a mirror to the reader, you know. Because more often than not, when uh, they laugh at a Garfield gag, it's because they're saying, isn't that true? Not necessarily because it's funny, but because there's that, you know, uh, uh, it resonates, you know, with the readers. Uh, what gets me out of bed every morning is still doing the comic strip. That's still, that's still my main contribution to the program. But I do all the writing uh, for the comic strip. I do rough thing because I see the gag uh, when I write it. And then uh, we do it digitally now, even though we're drawing it as we've always drawn it. It's just with a stylus instead of with a pencil and a pen. It's still rough. He has a whole system that was built around it so that everyone involved in the comic strip could see at any given time where something was. I do writing. I try to do it every week. Some weeks I'm funnier than others. So, uh, but then. In the meantime, uh, I like to work with um, the, a lot on the animation of the uh, TV series, um, usually, uh, usually on the animator, the director, and the studios in Paris. So uh, we get on video uh, conference calls, and we play animatics back and forth, and laugh, and things like that. Just basically um, walk around, laugh a lot, and uh, you know, stay out of everybody else's way. <laughs> It's a lot easier to get through the day, you know, if you handle it with a little bit of humor. Humor is kind of disarming, <laughs> and I think it puts people, you know, uh, in a mood that, you know, where they can accept, where they can, you know, uh, at least if it's just an emotional break to read a comic strip, have a smile, then you could face the rest of the day. So, um, If Garfield weren't funny, no one would care. If Garfield weren't funny, it would just be annoying. Um, but you could say that about so many of the other comic strips, um, right? If, if they're not going to be funny, they don't last. Um, the difficulty, isn't it? The, the difficulty is saying something that's funny that's not offensive to somebody, somewhere. How do you do that? How do you go through enough filters to make sure that this is universally funny? My philosophy is that uh, there are all kinds of ways, you know, of doing humor, telling gags. I don't do any shock humor or any like uncomfortable kinds of laugh. Actually, that's easier to do. It's really easy to do, you know, something real edgy uh, uh, and get a, a nervous laugh. But you don't necessarily feel better after you laugh. I like to think it's a shared laugh and you do feel better. In fact, even uh, maybe come away with a little better understanding of other people or something, or yourself, uh, after you've read the gag. That, for me, is the perfect laugh. If you had to put your finger on the real success of Jim Davis and Garfield, it said he's been able to be funny every day for 40 years without hurting anyone's feelings to everybody. It's extraordinary. I'm still trying to write that one gag that makes the whole world laugh, you know? Still trying to get right. <laughs> Garfield.